That's true. Naked Palpatine. Um. <laughs> oh, oh, you pick that one. Fresh out of the clone tank, nude Palpatine is my That's well, the first thing I think of when you say Dark Empire Palpatine. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Star Wars Expanded Universe. Now we're by Disney or Colonel Lucasfilm, whichever way you slice it. Legends. Supernatural Encounters. Whoa. Legends Con Edition. Oh, where's the, uh... Do I have to for this moment for my life? See this? Oh, no. Yep, that's pretty cool. We've reached it. Book six The biggest meat and potatoes of the entire section of Supernatural Encounters The Third Shadow. So, I have a lot to talk about here. These are, again, my thoughts. Um, I will be doing a review separately. Um, I'm not entirely done with the book. There's still uh, cult encounters left, which is at the end of this. And the notes, which, you know, the actual content of SC is about 940 pages, and the rest of it is the cult encounters and the other things. So, um, But still a pretty lengthy book, all things considered. It is an absolutely fantastic read. Not everyone will agree. And that is the way of things. But it is... If people want to know what it's about, you know. It is a lot like... Well, Stover puts it, you know. Darkness. Darkness superseding every facet of the world in every time period, and yet there's always hope, I think is the long end and short of it, um, in a nutshell, with this story, but let me get into some of the meat and potatoes of this section for all of you. Um, so we learn that the ones made the Thalior, that they were the ones who created that, the Thalior, what picks up all the people in Dawn of the Jedi and places them on Tython and everything. Rakatans are deceitful. They <laughs> try to run amok and, and do some stuff early on in this section. Um, we also get snuff, stuff with the Snow King, which is explaining stuff from the Ewoks cartoon or comics. We also get more Killick lore. Which is wonderful because it makes Dark Nest, um, which, you know, is admittedly not the best thing ever written. And gives a, you know, I mean, it's something that Finn Jedi already does with making the Killicks more important. But it recontextualizes a lot of the Killicks and actually makes it a lot more um, interesting and better. The Night Queen, who we've been reading about for five books now, she kind of goes rogue and does her own thing. Um, also, we have a very, uh, we also see the, um, sorry, the Ewoks used to be a lot more sophisticated than they are. Um, so we, we see the decline of them and the state that we kind of see them in, you know, the movies and the TV shows and all that. We get a very kind of like Ab and Eve thing here where the son and daughter, because they, the, the ones decided to live amongst mortals, or at least live within the plane that the mortals live on. And so they live on this, this, this place, um, not the place that we see in TCW, that's going to be later. But they live in this place, and the son and daughter are affected by the world around them. Or possibly some unknown threat. But the longer they stay on this planet, they speculate it's because of the world around them and the evil going on around them. But it could also be something more nefarious. 
Uh, not on their part, but on things surrounding them. Because the longer they spend on this world, the more they're twisted and morphed. Until we see what they are in the TCW episode, because they didn't start out that way. Um, they they kind of become, you know, this embodiment of light and darkness. Uh, but both are bad because she she becomes this extreme and he becomes another extreme. And then the father ends up having to be the middle trying to keep them relaxed. But that wasn't how they started. Like, they, they were all celestials. They were being affected by the world around them. They were being affected by sin, uh, you could put it. Um, but it's sort of this thing like, I mentioned Adam and Eve because, you know, they lived their lives, they were happy, they were great, they were grand, and then they ate from the tree, right? Um, and then they had infinite knowledge about everything. And that fundamentally changed them, right? Um, so it's a similar thing here where, you know, the Celestials are Celestials, they do their thing, but the more and more they spend time, they start being corrupted, you know, changing, you know, with the knowledge that they gain, they start becoming you know, certain aspects of things. The sun looking like how he looks like and TCW. The daughter the same because that's not how they started. And then the entire Abelov section. Uh, I cannot praise it enough. Um, you know, Baylock, she comes... Um, she comes into the picture, you know, she hangs out with all of them, and then she gets, you know, corrupted. And I, I think it actually makes her story more tragic, because originally what Fate of the Jedi sets up is she was just this normal girl, right? And she hung out with the one, she became the mother, and then she got corrupted by the, the fountain or whatever, and she changed into this eldritch monstrosity. And that's sad, and it works fine, but it actually is better this way. That she is the daughter of Titlani. Because the entire thing was that Baylot was the only good thing that Titlani actually created. Pure of heart, good, and all of that. Um, and she wasn't meant to be this eldritch. Because, like, everything that Titlani created was this, like, eldritch horror abomination. Baylot was the sole exception. And then she gets in this fountain and she becomes the very thing her mother didn't really want. Even though her mother's kind of like simpering around in her head to some extent. Um, and she morphs and changes into this eldritch horror. Um, and then the conversation she has with the father being like, did you know who I was and just withheld it from me? You know, and the father's like, no, I, I didn't. I loved you. You know, I loved you. Um, and... Abeloff just wanting a family, you know, also makes it more tragic. So I, I, I think everything, I think the best thing, and people disagree with this, I'm sure, but the best thing that this book has done is everything with Titlani and the Bedlam spirits and the Celestials and, and, and Abeloff, fleshing this out. I mean, these things were already around, right? I, people are always going to dislike things. And there's nothing you can do about it. But... Bedlam spirits exist. Abloth exists. Like, what even is Abloth? She doesn't even necessarily fit Star Wars. But it's an officially licensed work, so you've got to make it make sense. Make the Mortis arc make sense, because it doesn't on its own. It is gibberish. Me, Marcel, and Brennan discussed it at length, and how it is just like frosting on a cake, but with no cake. There's nothing to the Mortis arc, actually, at all. But now, with this book, there's so much to it. And that's what an expansion is meant to do. But anyway, everything with Abeloth in this section, absolutely phenomenal. Love, love, love what they did with her. There is, uh, they, they do end up, uh, she, she uh, escapes a couple different times, but she does have um, a prison of sorts. This isn't the one we'd see by the time of Fated Jedi, which is the Center Point Station and all that, but she, she does get um, imprisoned for a time. Uh, we have the Willow reference. Take it or leave it. Um, basically, Willow is on a planet. And the events of Willow happen on a planet. Out there somewhere. I don't mind it. 
I understand why other people wouldn't. Um, I don't know if the entire story of Willow happens. <sighs> but, like, the place that Willow takes place in is ju it's just on a planet. So, I, I mean, that's fine to me. Um, Abeloff first... She first escapes her first prison um, due to the Sorcerers of Rand. Because the Sorcerers of Rand were doing things. They accidentally unleashed her. So. We also learned that the Qua purposely turned themselves into the Qui um, for penance of their sins. Avaloth has now escaped. And her first army, the first time she ever tries to take over um, the galaxy. And she has the Kadai, the Rukata, and the Karadine. And that's Abeloth's first army. Abeloth also interacts with the Mother Machine. Um, within this section we see, because the Rukatans were not just working by themselves. they At this point in time, they were working with Abeloth. Um, because they had tried... To take over before and they failed to do so. They were trying to be deceitful and do that, but it didn't work out. So this time they have Abloff's help and now they're successfully doing things. So we, we see this in the beginning of the Dawn of Jedi comics where we see that Tatooine has become this this wasteland, has become this desert oasis when it wasn't always that um, in, in Star Wars. But there was an original people on that planet that would later become the Tuscans. This this is already established in lore. Um, we just get to see it. We get to see it unfold, the, the fight, um, where we're cottons are fighting um, these, these people. And by the end, you know, Tatooine becomes what we know it to be, and, and, they, and, and the people that originally have it become the Tuscans. <sighs> um. We also have the Starforge created. Um, due to Abeloth, or she was part of the reason that it was created, um, so that was cool. Um, and a lot of people are not going to like that, but, you know, you have this mysterious station that's just able to do this. Like, what's the explanation? We know that the Cottons used it, but we also know that they didn't make it. So that was something left hanging there. So I don't, I don't mind that. I also didn't realize, but 500 years prior to the Dawn of the Jedi is when Rakatans do what they do to Tatooine. Near the end of this section, Abeloth is confronted by these ancient evils. And these ancient evils legitimately make Abeloth look like a little girl complaining. They're so much more than she is. You gotta remember, Abeloth is weaker than Tidlani. Tidlani was about, maybe a little bit less, if not on the same par as these beings. So you realize there's these, these beings out there that are far worse than Abeloth. People go, what can Luke possibly face? He's faced Abeloth, he's faced everything, he's too powerful. He hasn't faced the most powerful things in the universe. These beings make Valkorian look like Darth Brandon or Bannon from KOTOR. Do you remember him? No, you don't because he dies really quickly. That's how insignificant it makes Valkorian look, makes Palpatine look by comparison. They're all squabbling over these minor things in the grand scheme, but... Completely different. I but it was really unnerving and 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 cool interaction to see between them. I also like the quote that Abeloff has in the end. Frick, frick, sorry. She says, "I will remake the galaxy with my love," which is just again in her warped perception of what she. Constantly tries to do. It's all out of love. Because she loves her family. But. I'm missing out a lot here. Because I read so much in this section. But Abeloth. Is a better character now. All because of Joe. 
like, like legitimately, like, I didn't really care for Abeloff and Fade the Jedi. This, this arc made me care. So thank you, Joe. Um, and that's the last, like, big section of that before we move on to stuff that we more know about. Um, because we have all that with, you know, Abeloff having this phenomenal discussion with the father and the son and, well, the son and the daughter just kind of there, but the whole section with Abeloff is just absolutely phenomenal. It's great stuff. Of course, if you don't like the ending verse, you're not going to care regardless, but, um, we learn that Dawn of the Jedi, the story that we know, is 36,453 BBY. Um, and the Mongol Mongol is summoned in Red Harvest. So the, the zombie outbreak that occurs in, Re in Red Harvest and in Death Troopers is due to the Mongol Mongol. Which was already speculated in source books prior, but this book just flat out confirms it. That the Mongol Mongol virus um, is an ancient eldritch horror which we've been reading about for five books now, um, it, it was summoned in Red Harvest from another plane. That's why the plague starts, because one of the Sith summoned it by accident. Um, we get sections that show, you know, Zim the Despot is this notorious being in the Star Wars galaxy in large part due to Brian Daly's work, but, you know, we learn about some of the good things he did. Because we, we know he did a lot of bad. But we learn about some of the good things he did as well. Which is cool. Um, there's also the Infernal versus the Infinite Empire. Because once Abeloff goes away again. And gets trapped or whatever. You know the Rakata are still there. And they're still, they're still doing their thing. And then you have the Sith. Or the true Sith. The, we're still dealing with the Red Sith at this point in time I believe. And the Infernal Empire is one of those things. And they're fighting against uh, the Rakatans. But then the Rakatans are also fighting against each other because they they have different, they got like red Rakatans and black Rakatans and they're all fighting, debating one another. So it's kind of like a war on two fronts because you got the war with the Rakatans and each other. You got the war against this infernal empire and then eventually you got the, you got the Jedi joining this fray as well. So it ultimately leads to the collapse of the infinite empire due to all of this Infernal struggle. I think the Infernal Empire was not an issue by the time of Dawn of the Jedi when the story actually takes place, but it still already caused damage. Um, but I could be wrong about that as well. Uh, there's a lot of information going on here. It was basically just a war on two fronts. Um, it specifically mentions that 25,000 to 20,000 BBY is when most normal people in the galaxy start to forget about the supernatural and start to not buy it. Like, the most that go is, yeah, the force is, is, is mystical. But that's as far as they'll go. Like, like people are unwilling to be as spiritual um, around this time. A lot of the people that are being born around this time don't remember anything from the ancient past. And so, they're just like, nah, nah. There's no, there's no spiritual stuff. Just do doesn't exist. Um... We get the third interlude. And it's very Lovecraftian of like, when you follow these main characters who know too much and you feel like they're going insane. Um, there's a similar thing with, with Arhul because he's, he's very clearly nervous and anxious and dreading the future. Um, and it's very much like all those characters in Lovecraft who have, who have seen the ancient lore that they shouldn't have seen and now their mind's deteriorating, you know. And then again, it begs into question, you know, does he actually have a reason to be nervous or is he just literally going insane? So, I um, mean, I took it as literal, of course, as I always do, but it is, it was a very, um, it, we, we've been getting so much information for such a long point in time now that it is nice to see our main character again for a second. <laughs> um... But yeah, like I said, I'm going over like several hundred pages right now, so I'm sorry if there was a lot I wanted to say about this book. I know there's more I wanted to say about Abeloff, but um, maybe when I do the videos with um, Marcel, once we get to these books in like four months from now, or when we get to these sections on his channel, 
I can talk more in depth about it, but as for now, it is what it is. Um, 34,500 BBY. We have the first great schism between the Jedi. Oh, I forgot about this. We have the three pillars that the Celestials come up with um, that would later get distorted and become what the Jedi believe and would later turn into what the Sith believe and would later turn into what, you know, uh, the Jedi believe by the time of, like, the KOTOR and everything. Uh, but we have the three pillars. We have emotion, yet we are at peace. We overcome ignorance with knowledge. When chaos strikes, harmony we increase. Crude matter are we. Death does abolish. But the force retains our identity. Servant of others, not rulers. Guardians of life in all of its forms. Defenders against evil. This is our sacred promise. Three pillars, our worldview and mission. First is the force, living and breathing. Second is that of knowledge. Third, self-discipline. Our path through these is long and winded and winding, yet we have been blessed. And this, our pledge, to obey the force's will and reflect good teachings. So that was, uh, I really enjoyed that. That's why I wrote the entire uh, mantra down. But we keep moving forward in time and we get uh, Zendor who meets the ones. We have soul sabers which are inspired by the mortis dagger. We also get more about the Yavetha, who are just racist forever. That's just what they are. They just are always racist. Um, this is going to be one of the more controversial sections, I know for a fact. People are going to lose their mind over it. Um, Jaguin and the Living Planet. Origins of the Vong. So the, the Jaguin were originally with the Vong, were called over time. Um, they changed in, into the Vong that we know them by the time of the New Jedi Order. Um, we also learn a lot about the living planet. Um, Zakat, the planet that we see in New Jedi Order and in Rogue Planet, is the grandchild of Cole Dandesin, um and his father, the father of Zakat. I mean, the father, when I say this, yes, it's it's not like there was sex involved. It was a different thing because they're living planets. But there is a, a precursor to the Zakat planet. And originally, the people of the Vong, the Jack Wynn, lived on the Zakat's father's planet body, whatever you want to call it. Um, over time, their religion changed. They were calling the planet a god for a long time, even though he never wanted to be called a god. And they morphed and changed into the Vong as we know them. And they constantly kept doing things that Zakat's father was against. And because of that, eventually, um, it is its will to basically take the force out of all of them, you know. So they lose, uh, they all become as we know the Vong to be uh, in, in that act. We also know that the other grandchild of Cold Dandesin is the living planet we see in Galaxy of Fear. So again, unnecessary connection, but I like it. I don't mind it at all. Am I missing something here? I don't know.
I think I got everything. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to assume I said everything I needed to say. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Again, sorry, there's a lot here. There's so much, guys. Um, but we also see plans of the ever-lengthening shadow. This is another constant theme you're going to see throughout the entire arc of uh, Supernatural Encounters is the dark. The dark is always patient. The dark, as mentioned in the episode 3 novelization that Lord Shadowspawn talks about, that the Sorcerers of Ran talk about, the dark now has triple, quadruple meanings to what episode 3 novelization talks about and to what Lord Shadowspawn talks about. It actually opens up the world to so many more possibilities. The dark is not just a metaphor but perhaps to a larger goal, a larger plan. And I love that. Because I love what Lord Shadowspawn talks about, and I always found it interesting why he has a different philosophy to the dark side, because he doesn't believe in the dark side, he believes in the dark. even says that when Palpatine went to destroy everything, he could not fail. But when he decided to try to build an empire, that's where he fell flat. That's when the dark left Sidious. So to have that expanded upon here and alluded to, I love that. Um, we also get this stuff with Darth Dreadwar, which also deals again with the dark as he, I think, interacts with some of these shadowy beings. Um, and then we get to a part I thought was really interesting. Um, I mean, this whole section is probably my favorite section of the entire book. But 7,103 BBY is Rise of the Sith. You know, we had the first great schism between the Jedi and stuff, but it's not till this moment that we actually get the, you know, the ancient Sith that we think about, which is um, Cure Danner, uh, Zexon, Sources Sin, Ramila Strepa, Carnus Moore. And Ajunta Paul and the Tulak Horde. You know, Ajunta Paul's from uh, Kotor. Uh, Karnas Moore's from the Kotor comics and from other things. Drepa, I think we saw in The Lost Tribe of the Sith. Zexon, of course, is the one that her spirit trains Darth Krayt. So these original, you know, um, Korriban uh, members. Um, we get to... We don't get like an in-depth story about them, but we do get to see their personalities a bit more than we've seen in other places, which is really awesome and cool. Uh, we also see an earlier iteration of what the Sith believed it would evolve and change over time, but theirs is, at this current moment, is peace is an illusion, passionate, I am strong, strong, I am powerful, powerful, I am victorious, victorious, I am unchained. By force, freedom is mine. So you can see how that would kind of change over time to what we see. Also, apparently, Zexon is an um, you, Umbaran and Zadi hybrid, which means I hate her even more now. Um, and by 6,900 BBY, um, the Dark Jedi of the Hundred Year Darkness. Uh, we deal with that section. Um, and then we get to see the Twelve Dark Lords of the Sith. Uh, the originators of that. And we have glimpses in the first Sith as, as we would come to know them. Um, and I, I'm not, again, like, I'm... There's so many pages of, of stuff that I'm just kind of glossing over right now to kind of give you an overview of stuff that I read and thought was cool and all that. Like, there's a lot here, right? I'm already at, like, 30 minutes, and I'm I'm just glossing over all this stuff. I'm not even going in-depth with it. There's so much here. Um, but, you know, after all that, we jump ahead to 
this is where we finally get to mostly familiar territory, but we still learn some interesting things. So here we get to 5,155 BBY, and we see a young Naga Sedao. So this is still before the, the Golden Age of Sith, but we, we get to see the, the early stages of that. We also get to see the Dark Dread War. His spirit is the one that trains Sadao. Um, we also see that um, shadows, these dark beings who have been in all of these books, um, talk to Dreadmoor, who basically acts as an atheist. He's like, no, you just exist in some different plane or something. You're not, you're not what you claim to be. You're not. You're just some being I don't understand yet, but you're not what you claim to be. And, uh, and I, I thought that was great. Because here, in the face of all evidence, and still, um, even Dreadwar, who's literally a spirit right now, claims that it's not real. I love people like that. It's insane to me. But it, it was fun. Um... Again, this is where we're going to all familiar territory. So we jump 600 years. We jump past um, the Golden Age of the Sith comics. And we see... Um, we, we deal with Frieden Nad. And we, we just deal with that whole section of things. You know, him learning from Naga Sadao and all that. And, you know, it's, it's not a huge section. But we do get a little bit more context for Frieden Nad. Especially since we don't really know a whole lot about the guy. So that was cool. Um, and we jump ahead to 4,980 BBY. Vitiat establishes his dark council on Drum and Koss. Um, here's the biggest controversial thing that this book has ever done, which is one of the biggest things that people critique this book for. Oh my god, are you ready? It only took six videos to get here, and like nine, 800 and like 60 pages of, of, Freaking story to get here. Nak or Neek Quadroma is Ulix, not necessarily bastard, but a son he didn't really acknowledge because he's sent straight to the Jedi Order. Nek Quadroma is Revan. So Joe decided, I'm gonna make Revan more important to the uh. Tales of the Jedi comics. So Revan is not just some random dude. He's now the son of Ulick. And this would have been before. This would have been after his defeat as a Sith Lord. But before he went to exile in Redemption. He did it with his Cathar chick. Had a kid. That kid was sent straight to the Jedi Order. And then. Um, eventually. Stuff happens, and you look ends up on redemption, and we still get the redemption story as we know it. But that means, and Revan doesn't even learn his origin to like either right after the Mandalorian Wars or like right before. Um, so I don't really remember necessarily, but he doesn't know for most of his life anyway. Um, here's one that I was a little less enthusiastic about. I'll be honest. The other one, I'm like, that's fine. I literally don't care. But then it was like too much of a coincidence. It kind of annoyed me. Um, I accept it though. I'm not like going to like say this book is awful because of this, this thing, but I did find it a little really that, um, Nima Freestar is the exile, um, real name. And she is the second daughter uh, a Vima Sunrider. Didn't necessarily care, which basically, in a weird about way, I mean, it doesn't make Revan and Exile connected at all, really, but it's just funny because, you know, Ulick and Nomi had that romantic interest. So, like, in a weird sense, they're kind of like this, like, if you look at it from a certain point of view, they're kind of like cousins, but they're not at all. But it's, it's just, it's just weird. Um, wasn't the biggest fan of that, but hey, now Kotor 2 is more relevant to that too. One thing I absolutely love, and I have absolutely no issue with whatsoever, is that we learn. Because we know that, you know, Vima trained with Ulick and everything, and then what happens to all these people during Kotor? They're just nowhere to be seen. What we do learn here is that Vima was Bastila's master, which 
I like that. That's fine. You know, Basil is an entirely new character, but she was trained by a legacy character from the comics of, of Tales of the Jedi. And I like that. I think that's a good, I think that's a good, you know, because, especially because Vima was originally supposed to be in the KOTOR video game, but they couldn't do it. So I like the idea that, okay, well, she didn't get to be in the game, but she trained the one that's the main character in the game. I like that. I think that's good. Um... Confirmation and validation that Revan and Malik don't turn dark because of Ishiot. Now people are going to push back on this. I don't care. I've been saying this for years that it doesn't necessarily have to be a contradiction. Right? So Revan and Malik, they fight in the Mandalorian Wars. They're already teetering on darkness with the things that they are doing. They then go to the unknown regions at some point and discover Vitiate. Who then, you only have two circumstances because they clearly aren't being mind controlled by the time of KOTOR. They aren't. They are doing their own thing. Malak is doing his own thing. So, two options here. Revan and Malak meet Vitiate. And Vitiate mind controls them or whatever. Then, as they are hiking on back to the core worlds, they break free of the control. And then they get to do whatever they want and they still decide to be Sith Lords because they see it as the only way to defeat Vitiate. But they, um, they're messing with the dark side so it eventually corrupts them. Or the second option is Vitiate tried to mind control them but it didn't work. And then they still choose the dark side because they have to find a way to defeat Vitiate. Now people try to claim, well, Revan claims explicitly the opposite. But I guess you forgot the part where Vitiate messes with his mind again during Swotor. Which is 300 years after all of this. But I guess you forgot that bit. I guess you forgot. Because Revan is living far longer than he's supposed to due to Vitiate. And Vitiate's constantly messing with his mind. So I think you misconstrued some things if you're saying that when Revan says in Swotor that he was being controlled by Vitiate, that he's talking about during the events of KOTOR, before the events of KOTOR. Anyway, so the, the book says that Vitiate tried to take over Revan and Malak's mind, but they resisted. And then... They lied to Vitiate that they were under his control, and then they bailed to go back to the Cold World. But Vitiate's Vitiate. He knows that they didn't get possessed or anything or controlled. He just doesn't care. Because so long as they join the dark side of their own fruition, they will still cause harm to innocence. They will still serve the dark. Again, the dark mentioned. Um, but yeah, I love that. Because it bridges the two and makes it fine. Right? Because the initial premise with Revan um, was that he was disillusioned with the Mandalorian Wars and joined the dark side because of his disillusioned with the Jedi Order. And all that is still true because he was already teetering on the dark side during the Mandalorian Wars. He might as well have been Jason Solo in Darkness. Oh my God. It's like the same thing. It's like, it's like poetry, it rhymes. And then, and then he goes to the Unknown Regions finds Vitiate, almost gets controlled by him, and goes, this guy is a threat. This is a true Sith Empire. We have to band together because the Jedi, Alec, Malak, you and I both know, the Jedi have been pieces of garbage in this era, and they have not been helpful. And the Republic is not going to be helpful. We have to prepare these people for the worst of the worst. Because not only is there Vitiate to contend with, we know there's some big army hidden out there. We have to prepare for it. We have to be ready for it. So they join the dark side. They want to take over the galaxy. Take over, have an entire empire to take down Vitiate. So they still join the dark side of their own fruition to stop some greater threat as Kreia from KOTOR 2 alludes to. And Vitiate did try to control them. So all still work. 
all still fit and blend together if you wanted to. If you want to hate SWOTOR because it's SWOTOR, fair enough, but this is a perfect way to synergize the two. You know, and then there's people that really love SWOTOR and won't like this either. So there, there's going to be a whole spectrum of things. But I think this is a perfect synergy and a perfect middle ground for this conundrum. Um, also, Scion. I've heard some people complain about Scion. Why? People are going, well, it, 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 it implied that that Scion only became what it became after, after Malachor 5. I just don't understand it. Why why was he fighting in in in, in the in the Sith Wars uh during Tales of the Jedi? I, I just don't understand it. Like, do you, do you realize what you're saying here? Like, do you not realize the time gap between Tales of the Jedi and Kotor is so small? Do you not realize that? Do you not realize that? Like are, are like are, have you not used your brain today? Like, World War One, to World War Two. You do know that people from World War One fought in World War Two. You know that, right? You know that happened because they were like pretty close together. Like, early 1900s, 1940s. People were still alive that were alive back then. Is it in, is it impossible for Scion to have been in the Sith Wars and then been in the Mandalorian Wars? Is that impossible to have happened? No, it isn't. You just want to complain. It's not an issue. Sorry. That was annoying. Um, I also didn't realize that SWOTOR literally has a war the size of Halo. Because 3,681 BBY, the Galactic Civil War happens, and that goes on for 30 years. Like, all those trailers we see for SWOTOR, all... That is a short span of time. That is a short little preview into something that took place over 30 years. Before the MMO even starts. This Galactic Civil War took 30 years. And the same thing with the Halo uh, stories with fighting the Covenant. That was a like a 30 year long conflict. Um, and so. Uh, that was crazy. And then at. 3681 is when the Galactic Civil War began, and 3643 is when the Cold War began. That's when the actual, um, actual, uh, MMO begins. Sorry. Also, one second. Anyway, apologies there. Um, then we see sections of the Star Wars universe 500 years after SWOTOR would have ended. So that was cool. Um, which, I mean, SWOTOR is still ongoing, but it's 500 years and, and the game's not going to go on for another 500 years. So We get to 2000 uh, BBY and we get to see a little bit about Darth Ruin. Um, and his entire belief system. We also learned that Damien... Um, from Knight Errant is inspired by Ruin till he's so messed up and warped by Darth Ruin's kind of ideology that he believes that he came up with it himself. I love Damien. It's funny. Of course, we get Bane. We already know about Bane. So, not too much to say there, but Bane, the Bane stuff happens. Um, we learn that, uh, more about the Life Bearers. From the Corellian trilogy, you know, the Corellian, uh, Lando tries to marry this one chick and says, like, oh, you can be with me for five years happy and then you're going to die. You know, so <laughs> we get more lore about that. We get the Lord Nyax uh, legend. Because this is actually a thing established in the New Jedi Order books. I think it's Wedge or somebody. Somebody from Corellia talks about this boogeyman urban legend tale about Lord Nyax, you know, and then of course we meet the guy from Children of Jedi, um, in, in, in the New Jedi Order, but that's not what they're talking about when they talk about Lord Nyax, they're talking about this ancient, you know, this old bedtime story about this, this old, you know, scare kids, you know, at night, the kind of story about Lord Nyax, but here we get the actual truth to that, or, you know, you can deny it, but, but you know, um, and this section was probably one of my favorites of the entire book, I absolutely loved um, there's a part where he also interacts with these shadowy beings and, you know, then he comes back to 
you know, try to take over his planet or whatever. And he's like, this is what we need to do, 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 do. Uh, without getting into big spoilers, I guess. But again, it just makes me go, Jason's fall. Knowledge of realms leads to darkness. Like, Lornax goes on this tangent, but like, I, I, I've seen the, I know, I know. We have to do this. We need to. We need to. You don't understand. The things that I know, the things that I've seen, we need to be ready. We need, I know what's best for us. And again, it's the same thing where if Jason, in any way, shape, or form, saw any of these things, saw any of this, and was able to somehow block it out so he wouldn't go insane, like Lord Nyx kind of did, but the scars of that would remain in his subconscious. You couldn't just forget it. So it would just stay there in the back of your mind, which could help perfectly explain why he acts different in darkness. You don't have to like it. But it's freaking beautiful. I, I hope I can make something compelling out of that. Um, 400, um, or sorry, 1,100 uh, BBY. We learned about Low Gray and Morag, which are both characters from uh, the Ewok uh, show. Oh, and then... Like, one of the best entire sections of the whole book, making what was an acid trip actually be an interesting story. Cody Sunchild. You you remember him? From that one issue of, of, of the Marvel comics? Amazing character now. I'll never read that comic the same way again. Oh my god, I love this section. I'm not going to tell you anything more about it. It, 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 it contextualizes everything about that comic that I thought was an acid trip and makes it worth a damn. It actually makes it kind of inspiring. Oh my god, amazing. It was an amazing section. Um, Dothmir, Dothmiri and Dread War. So Dread War, again, is a spirit. And there's a Dothmiri chick who um, uh, journeys with him to learn some things. Uh, and then he does his own thing. And then stuff happens to Dread War. Which I, I won't get into. You can read the book to find out. Also, these dark beings, yet again, talk about seven seals to break free and to cause havoc. And some of those seals were Center Point Station. Some of those seals are things that we know about but haven't been destroyed yet. So that made a foreboding possible future, um, which I loved. And again, the dark mentioned Again, it's a running theme throughout this entire book. Look for the dark. And the dark having its own agenda and motivation. Keep at it. We also get Leia's defense of the book. Because then we get back to the trial and everything. And she's like, I literally saw the Bedlam spirits. I was literally there. Devil Worlds, you remember that? I was there. I don't necessarily agree with everything in this book. I don't know if I can believe all of it. But you can't just dismiss it. I saw those beings with my own two eyes. I died and came back to life. And you know, people counter, I believe that you thought that you died, but you didn't. Um, but regardless, it was, you know, I've heard some people, again, uh, she's just the mouthpiece for Joe Bongiorno's, like, new mytho mythological stuff. It's like, what? It would make no sense for all these things to be discussed and for Leia not to bring up the events of Devil Worlds. It would be utterly bizarre. Or, oh hey, I got saved by Wustek. If she didn't mention these things, it would seem so out of place. So of course she's going to bring that up. What are you on about? Ugh, anyway. We also get to see Don Juan Quixote, which is that old guy from the old Marvel comics. That was funny. Um, the vote lost. It was like 49 to 37 or something. Um, and then we get the epilogue. And in the end, they did publish the work. Um, did everyone believe the work? No, but it did at least get published. Uh, because Q9, stuff happens at the end. Um, Q9 essentially like, whether you believe it or not, Hexaphon was, like, inside Q9 and, like, showed them visions of, like, heaven. But not heaven, but it was, like, this wonderful place that you could all go to in the future. And everyone saw it, you know, um, saw a vision of this.
but they went, well, you know, maybe you just conjured up a, tr a, a really cool trick, you know, like, it's not out of the blue, I mean, we have illusion stuff in the Star Wars galaxy already, so a lot of people just took it as some elaborate illusion, other people, of course, believed it, but a lot didn't, and that's, that's what you would see in real life anyway, like, if God could come down today and be like, I am God, believe in me, and then zip away, um, and you'd be like, dang, I need to go to the hospital, you wouldn't actually believe it. Uh, people say they would, but they wouldn't. Um, so they would find an excuse to not believe in it. Um, because they'll, the, a lot of people pull the Matt Dillahunty of, uh, you know, having a burden of proof that's so high that there's, and not actually having an answer for what that burden of proof is. That way nothing could ever actually dissuade the belief that it's not real. Like nothing, nothing could. Um, even Richard Dawkins is like, uh, you know, if, uh, God could say, I am Yahweh and the stars in the heavens. And I would just go, oh, well, it's aliens messing with me. So literally finding any way to not, to have an, it could be explicitly clear. The waters could part in his name and someone would go, well, it's aliens. I'd rather believe aliens sooner than believe it was God who did it. So you, there, there's always an excuse. So um, the fact that some supernatural elements happened at the very end in front of everyone doesn't stop me from going, well, if you want to say that this book is BS, you still can. Because you can just do what the historians did and just say, well, that's BS. It was some elaborate thing. It didn't happen. Coolio, you know, and that's fine. But, you know, the idea that it like 100% confirms with absolute certainty that the supernatural is real and Star Wars or whatever, I, I don't think is necessarily true. But also, why not accept this book? Why not? It's, it's, it's better than most Star Wars books. Um... But yeah, I only have cult encounters left. That'll be a separate video. This video is already a million hours long. But um, thank you all so much for watching. Um, thank you, Joe Bongiorno. It, it has been... I love this book. And not everybody's going to. It's going to be controversial forever. But it... It was a worthwhile experience. And I'm glad I got to read it. So I'm glad I got to meet you. And uh, I hope to see you at 2025 Legends Con. Or whenever the next one is. Um, but yeah, it's it's been a... Phenomenal read. And I don't regret a second of reading it. I mean, that's all for, for now, guys. I'll do an actual review some other time. But you won't see it here. Until next time, guys. May the Force be with you.